So I wanted to be a diplomat. And uh, you get to wanting to be a diplomat when you have uh, parents who are not from the United States because politics is deeply rooted everywhere but the U.S. It's like everyone pays attention to politics. My parents are from Grenada. And so I wanted to be a diplomat, told myself I was going to be a diplomat, uh, got the best grades I could get. My mother encouraged me throughout my entire upbringing. Uh, this is for you, this is for you, this is for you. Um, 18 years old, a couple months from graduating high school, and I am pregnant. And so I am like, I don't think that I'm going to be a diplomat, right? Because what does your life look like? Like, how do you get to go to college and have the college experience? How do you get to become the person that you thought that you were going to be for the rest of your life when this has happened to you? And so my plan shifted a little bit. Um, my father uh, was, he's good at everything, he's here today. Um, he can just read a book and know to how to fix something, plumbing, electricity, whatever it is. And so we had an uncle um, that worked for IBM. He gave us a computer and my dad and I would tinker with this computer. We seemed to be the only two people in the household that really cared about this computer. Um, and so at 18, I was like, you know what? Computers, it's 1999, I'm gonna age myself. Um, computers are the wave of the future. I know how to work on them and so I'm just gonna get into the IT field and see where that takes me. But deep down inside, I want to be a diplomat. Like I thought I was going to go to college, get a degree, go to law school, and then go live in some foreign country and enjoy my life. And so uh, let's move on uh, because a bunch of things have happened in my life that you know everyone has adversity and triumphs and those kind of things. And so now I think it's like 2016. I don't know the exact year because uh, uh, the trauma of it makes me block out the year. So my mother had cancer when we were very young. I was like eight or nine the first time my mom had cancer and she survived it, go mom, right? And then it's like 2016, I think, and she has cancer again, right? And it's breast cancer again and it kind of throws everything for a loop because I'm settled into my life um, I'm not fully settled because I still feel that tension that I'm not where I want to be or where I need to be. Um, but so I'm settled into my life and then my mom has cancer and I'm just thinking about all the things that I want to do, all the things that my mother wanted to do, all the things that my brothers and sisters and I have hoped for our parents because they've done such a great job taking care of us that we want them to retire, we want them to enjoy retirement, we want them to go back to Grenada, we want to send our kids there for the summer so we don't have to deal with them. Um, so, you know what I mean? And so all those things start to play in your mind and you just start to feel like you're in a space where you're compressed and you need to just break out of it. So we're going to fast forward to 2019. My parents have finally retired. My mom retired and in my mom's typical fashion. She goes to work one day and is like, I'm not coming back. Right? And so that's how she retires. And that's December of 2018. And my dad, he retires in February of 2019. And so I'm excited because I'm like, my parents, they moved to Florida, they're retired. My mom has always wanted to go to the Canary Islands. I'm going to go to the Canary Islands with her. I'm booking cruises. And then my mom is just persistently sick, persistently sick. And then we find out that it's terminal. And now she's like sick, sick, sick. And you have to start thinking about, like, that's the moment where you start thinking about, all of the things that your parents have impressed upon you. Um, education is going to take you where you need to go, um, find information, get information, education, education, and just you start to feel like, I need to really branch out, live my life, live my life. And so it's while my mother is sick and we're all doing our jobs to take care of her that I say, well, you know what, you want to go to law school, you want to be a diplomat, you put all these things off because you thought that you couldn't achieve them, but you can right? And so I started looking and I was like, well, let me find out how I can take the LSAT. What does that look like? Got a voucher to take the, uh, the LSAT. And then I started studying and I'm taking care of my mom or I'll take care of my mom. And, and I'm studying, 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 and then she passes away, right? It's December, she passes away. My LSAT is scheduled for February. 
they're from Grenada, and if you have parents from a foreign place, you take them to where they're from to bury them. You don't bury them here. And so we don't bury my mother till February. I come back from burying my mother, and my LSAT is like two weeks away. And I haven't studied because I stopped studying in November because her condition had just digressed so much. And I'm just like, mm, I'm gonna take it because I took the time to research and find out how to get this voucher for the LSAT. And I took the time to start studying. And I thought to myself, this is what I wanna do. And I have this deep sense like, now is the time, now is the time. All the things that my mother didn't get to do, all the things that my mother wanted for me, I can't not take this opportunity and take this LSAT. So I take it. I did decent, I got into law school, right? And so here I am, I'm in law school. Law school is like the best, worst thing that ever happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because on the one hand, you're like, you're, you're in a room full of very smart people, and you're like, I gotta be super smart to be in this room full of all these smart people. And on the other hand, if you're a first generation American, first generation law school, law student, you have no idea what you're doing here, what this day looks like. Um, people are saying things that you're like, how could you possibly know that? And you start comparing yourself to people and like, how come they're so good at it? You don't know they've been paralegals for the last 10 years, right? <laughs> they never say it, they're just right. like so good in class and you're like, how's that possible? And so you start digging and digging and digging and researching and, and, and trying to educate yourself on how to become a better law student. And for me, my experience, um, I go to Stetson, my experience at Stetson was that I was doing just good enough, right? So I'm not failing, I'm getting like three O's, three two fives, I'm a good law student. And, but I want to do better, and I know I have test anxiety and all these different things, and I'm going to the Academic Success Center, and because I'm not failing, they're not paying attention to me, right? So it's like, you have to be actually failing, flunking out for them to be t paying attention to you. And I'm like, I need help because I have imposter syndrome, I have test anxiety. Um, everyone around me seems to understand Iraq and I'm not getting it, right? And so no one's paying attention to me. And so I kind of just struggled through law school Google searching, as my dad calls it, the University of Google, and I'm just, you know, feeling my way through it. And then I go to a BALSA event, and I meet Miss Brielle. And Miss Brielle passes me a card. We're at the table, and her and her husband are the sweetest people I've ever met in my life. And she passes me a card, and she's like, apply for the scholarship. And I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get this scholarship, because, like, the GPA requirements, I'm like, just under it, because I'm like, you know. And so I'm like, I'm never going to get this, but I do it. And, and, and it was Brielle, like just how welcoming she was and like, John, do it. We need, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to mentor and support uh, black law students, just do it. And so I do it not thinking I'm going to get it because it's the imposter syndrome. Why would anyone give me anything? And I've been struggling through law school this entire time. And so, yeah. And then I interview and I remember my interview because I was like, I'm just gonna lay it all, all on the table. I remember one of the last things I said was like, welcome to Death Row Records, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I hang up and from the interview and I call my sister and I'm like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I did tell them welcome to Death Row Records. And so, you know, she's like, that was awesome, you're awesome. And, and my older sister is like really super encouraging. And then I get into the program and the program is everything that I have wanted it throughout my entire journey in law school, like Anouk has said. All of the mentorship, all of the identity, like you look at Miss Jocelyn and you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. This is what I've been missing. This is the experience I've been missing throughout my entire legal education of just being in a room full of people who understand me, who support me, who want to help me. And then if you tell Miss Jocelyn like, hey, I wanna, I wanna fly to the moon. She's like, oh, I know somebody. <laughs> she gets in contact with that person, and then when you get in contact with that person, they actually speak to you about how to build the rocket ship to fly to the moon. So it's not just like on the surface 
uh, uh, fish, it's like, no, I know someone who can get you to the places that you want to be. And so this program, you know, there were, we, we went through, you know, the different cycles and we learned about uh, writing bar essays and uh, applying to clerkships. And these were all things that you're listening to Jocelyn. She just has this gentle way of encouraging you along. You're listening to her and you're like, I didn't think it was possible for me to be a judicial clerk. I didn't think it was possible for me to pass the bar. I didn't think it was possible for me to create a, a bar exam essay. And then Jocelyn is just pushing you along and all of the people in Journey to Esquire, all of the board members, everyone who's helping out, they're just pushing you along and encouraging you along to a point where you're like, okay, I started law school, I'm a part-time law school, I work, uh, law student, I work full-time. I started law school and I was like, oh, you're like, you're never going to be a good attorney. You're going to be an attorney, but you're not going to be the Matlock you thought you were going to be. And then by the end of the program, I'm like, man, you're going to be Matlock, Perry Mason. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> all these different attorneys because in those moments where you doubt the type of attorney you're going to be or the type of person you're going to be, you have a Jocelyn, you have Journey to Esquire, and they're always there to lift you up and say, this is your next step, uh, dust yourself off, this is how you get there, and just keep moving forward and, and to be successful. So that is my testimony, and that's why I love Journey to Esquire.